Welcome to the Futurist Society podcast, where we delve into the latest advancements in technology, science, and culture. From discussions on the latest breakthroughs in AI, biotechnology, and space exploration, the Futurist Society is your window into all of the awesomeness that the future holds. Get ready to be informed and inspired as we consider the positive impact of emerging technologies on humanity. Without further ado, welcome your host, Dr. Awesome. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Futurist Society, where we are broadcasting from the present and talking about the future. Today, we have Julia Walsh, who is a thought leader in the intersection between search engines and healthcare and how people are getting all of the different information that they're able to make their healthcare decisions. So, Julia, thank you for coming today. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into this space? It's a pleasure to be here, Dr. Awesome. Um, I got into this space basically inspired by my own experience as a carer. And, um, you know, I really started to understand, it was brought home to me, how important the kind of information that you get online when you turn to the internet to exchange questions for health advice. Um, so I really wanted to kind of add um, an expansive view of that and really understand the impact of this channel of exchange of information on the broader healthcare ecosystem. Um, and also to stay to date with how it's changing because the digital landscape is rapidly evolving in front of our eyes right now, of course, with the advent of AI driven chat. Um, so that's how I kind of started getting into it. Yeah, and I think that I really wanted to speak with you because I think that we're in an inflection point right now where in the past, I feel like most people were going to Google and they were looking at, you know, 10 different websites and making kind of a, an educated guess based on the information that they ascertained from those 10 different websites. Now, a lot of people are going to chat GPT, which is a one source model, and it, it's been shown to be not as um, uh, effective in giving accurate and legitimate answers to their questions. So tell us a little bit about that, like what you're seeing and how people are using AI versus how people have used it in the past? Yeah, well, basically, we're bearing witness to the biggest disruption to the way health information is exchanged since the advent of the internet itself. Um, you're correct in saying that people are starting to turn to chat GPT, and I think a lot of the focus on that particular tool has been um, the generation of content and the saving of time. I think there's going to be a very quick adoption of it as well in terms of like, oh, I've got this niggling symptom or I've just I've been diagnosed with this disease. I'm going to turn to that instead of my traditional chat. So the normal like menu of ranked websites that we're so accustomed to being off offered and we love it. I mean, there's a billion health related questions put into Google every single day. Um, so, you know, so we're very accustomed to that particular I guess, um, method and process of getting health advice. Um, but the search engines themselves are also in a race to integrate tools like ChatGPT into their search experience. So you've got new Bing and you've got Google's search generative experience. And, um, and you're right, like going into those at the moment, they're still in their infancy. So while we're sort of being forced to transition across there's still some inherent sort of glitches that are going to need to be ironed out with these tools. Because on one hand, they can scrape all of the wide knowledge from the entire internet and put it into one succinct answer. And that is powerful and that is super useful, um, especially if you have low health literacy, we don't have a lot of time. Um, but on the other hand, they do make stuff up. And uh, we've seen that in our research at Brand Medicine as well. So when you say your research, uh, what is it focusing on? And is it just focusing on the creation of uh, false information from artificial intelligence? Or is it how people are using search engines? What are, you, what are you looking at right now? We wanted to kind of take a point in the future and understand what the trajectory is going to look like. Um, of course, we could all put our heads in the, in the sand as a healthcare industry and just figure it's going to kind of like evolve in its own way. 
or we could proactively lean into this change and shape the future digital landscape so that we can ensure that patients and doctors, in fact, like yourself, um, actually get the locally relevant evidence-based information that they need. We want that to turn up where and when they look for it. Um, and so we recently wrote a white paper on AI disruptions in search to kind of look at it from a broad perspective and understand not just the, um, the challenges, but also the opportunities for improving healthcare. Particularly, I think there are benefits for people who don't have um, the traditional like um, affordability, like to get actual healthcare in a normal fashion, this is going to offer them like a running start to understand what's going on with themselves, as well as people who are in rural and remote areas. And of course, um, you know, I think there's going to be opportunities to kind of address and equalize um, the diversity challenges that some groups have with respect to accessing healthcare. Um, so we are seeing this change, and I think there are lots of positives. But at the same time, while we were writing that white paper, we wanted to actually do some real research and understand, you know, what's going on with these hallucinations and what is actually happening when we ask for sources. So, for example, on one hand, we asked for a PubMed reference that would support the use of ivermectin in COVID. And as you can imagine, of course, it's a very controversial topic. When people are arguing in social media, which is downstream of search, they will pull whatever they can find in to support their argument. And ChatGPT offered us an incredibly, like, um, you know, valid looking reference with a PubMed number and everything. When you took that PubMed number across and put it into PubMed to verify it, it was a paper on stroke and absolutely nothing to do with ivermectin or COVID. Yeah. So I think collectively, we know we're going to step backwards before we can step forwards into this space. Yeah, I noticed that too. I, I have been leaning on it heavily for my own presentations and lectures, and that requires a certain number of resources to be coming from peer-reviewed papers. And when you look up those peer-reviewed papers, they're just, they're not real. You know, I don't think, I don't think the people realize that. Yeah. When they're when they're looking in th at this stuff, so how do we fix that? I, what is is it is it on the responsibility of the AI companies, or how, I just don't know how to fix that. You ask such a good question. I mean, you know, who is accountable? Mm -hmm. um, poor health advice can have pretty dramatic outcomes in the real world. Mm -hmm. It can mean someone doesn't check a symptom that urgently needs to be checked. It can mean they can take their medicine incorrectly. It can mean that they stop taking their medicine. Um, there are all kinds of things. I often also see in search people being redirected down pathways where they're getting crazy advice, um, like for tinnitus, put garlic oil in your ear and, and stuff like that. These are the kind of contents that are served yeah. back on page one in traditional Google search. AI tools are scraping the content with high domain authority on the visible web. Mm -hmm. The other thing that compounds this in, in most markets of the world regarding prescription therapies is that there are regulatory restrictions that prevent the pharmaceutical companies from being able to publish answers to questions like, can I crush this tablet or can I drink alcohol with that? Everything sits behind a firewall. So the AI tools are not going to get them. Um, so who is responsible? Yeah, I mean, I think that's why we are really recommending off the back of our white paper that as an industry and as patient advocacy groups and as government regulators, we lean into this and work together in a collaborative way with the search engines to improve the quality of this experience. But genie's out of the bag. We're not going back to traditional search. This is a one-way pathway, I believe. Um, and I, I see a lot of positive future potential for it from the point of view you could be walking down the street just chatting with your AI search tool to quickly try and understand something that's going on with your health and you'll get an answer back through your headphones um, the other thing is that it's infused with empathy as well and, and that is you know that's really nice for someone who's worrying about their health um, but I think at the short term we need to make people aware that you know the content could be bad and I think Currently, because it looks so credible, 
um, we are going to see across the whole healthcare ecosystem an impact from people believing what they get served through these tools when in fact there isn't the evidence to underpin that advice potentially. Mm -hmm. What are some other things that you looked at in the white paper that you would hope that the general public would know? Because I know that this is something that you work really hard on and you uh, you know, have, have really put out there with the interest of people using this as a resource to uh, prevent yeah. some of the downstream effects that you're seeing. So, so what are some other things that you wish that the, the, you know, your family members would know about using this kind of software? Um, well, we were, we were looking at the um, pharmaceutical industry and how it could really um, adapt and, and undertake their necessary internal dig digital transformation to, first of all, count for the importance and influence of the exchange of in, um, information on these platforms, as well as how to respond to it. Because I think additionally, they can be slow as an industry to kind of dabble in these areas because they don't have a framework for how to do it. Um, meanwhile, it's like a runaway fire. So, so a lot of what we looked at were critical success factors for different internal departments from IT to medical to marketing to leadership um, and things like that. From a patient point of view, we were recommending um, this support put into making sure that the search engines have some form of accountability, making sure that um, we work collaboratively with them. So if someone asks about an oncology treatment or any kind of prescription medicine within a market, we would like to see the search engines as a mandatory attaching the local PI or product information and CMI, consumer medical information that's more accessible for patients to read to that answer as a reference, which currently they're not doing. Currently from our research in the white paper, what we saw was drugs.com is a very, very influential website that is often driving a lot of the time the content. Um, Wikipedia is another one that's been popularly scraped and consolidated or concentrated into these answers, Reddit. Mm -hmm. um, so what's happening is we're seeing a swing from, from evidence-based, um, from you know clinical trials that are well-controlled across to aggregated summary of individual rec, um, reviews, which are kind of one. We don't know the comorbidities of that patient. We don't know what dosing they were on. We don't know what other medications they were on. Mm -hmm. um, it's unverified and it's so you know we're really seeing that swing for friends and family i would just say you know take it with a grain of salt don't make a decision based on that advice that you get online and, and act on it without talking to your doctor first you know how you say how the genie is out of the bottle um mm -hmm. i i feel like i initially thought that about chat GPT and just any sort of AI offering in general, but now I find that people have realized some of the things that you're talking about, that it's not as uh, great as, as we initially thought it was. I'm still using it on a regular basis to write emails and things like that, things that are just mundane tasks that don't really have like a lot of um, uh, necessity for accuracy. But when it comes back to accuracy, I feel like me, myself, I'm going back to Google and I'm doing the traditional method. And a lot of people that, you know, I had, I had introduced this to are doing the same thing. Is that backed up by user data or is that just my own feeling? I, I, I wonder if it's actually like the adoption is, is actually as significant as people are making it out to be. Um, well, certainly it was the most adopted, most rapidly adop adopted tech in history with over 100 million users within the first three months. Um, I think looking at chat GPT on its own is not taking account of what's happening in Bing and, um, and Google itself. So they are actually pushing this type of search platform to users 
And I feel like it's not going to be very long where they may also phase out the mm. traditional menu of ranked websites where you have the opportunity to do your own research. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know how long in the future that's going to be. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think the, the place to be keeping your eye on is new Bing and Google's SGE which is where people are basically having those kind of exchange, like what you experienced on ChatGPT across in their search engine. Um, but it's driven by the same mechanisms. And so that's why I think, yeah, I think it, it is pretty much a one-way road towards mm -hmm. generalized adoption of this. And of course you're a doctor, so you will have more, you know, more sense around the need for verifying the kind of references that he used and we saw that lawyer the very high profile case in the US where they where <laughs> he cited in court precedents for a particular case and it had just been made up mm -hmm. his whole research team including himself overlooked that it wasn't real um yeah. and yeah. um so i think that's helped people like yourself and myself who are in health to like take another look and do a bit of a double take but the average person, your average patient, who maybe works as an electrician or in a completely other industry, don't think that we can count on them to be questioning it. So I think as a movement, we need to start to shape the digital landscape ourselves in a proactive way to make sure that they're getting the right kind of information. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I certainly think that it's, it's more natural I, I, to, to ask someone a question as opposed to typing in a question and doing research it just seems mm -hmm. something that human beings are ingrained into doing it's something that we've probably yeah. been doing for a lot longer than we've had a written history and so i want that i want that experience of being able to talk to somebody and and kind of going down this you know thought process similar to what we're doing right now but mm -hmm. i just i i think that it's just so um uh, yeah i just it, it it is a little bit concerning i think that you know it, the market forces are going to be such that i just feel like i'm i'm optimistic about it i think that people will figure it out and i'm glad there's people like, out there like you that are kind of pushing the mm -hmm. the the policy in such a direction that there are these kind of uh factors will be taken into account but i just i i think that it is something that that is going to happen. It's just a matter of time, and I just feel like that the best process is going to win out, you know. Um, but maybe that's a naive way. Yes, of it will. It will yeah. ultimately. I think, um, you know, we we are on a journey where it is going to sort of correct itself um, through, like you say, market forces as well as feedback, as well as regulatory framework and ethical guardrails that all need to be put in place. I think it's hard for governments at the moment because how can you regulate something that was changing so fast? I mean, it's like a double exponential change. It's crazy. Um, and, you know, people people will start to, you know, I guess approach it with a grain of salt and, and hopefully get the kind of answers that they deserve to get at different points in the patient journey from these tools the thing about them as well, like you say about the natural language, is that in my work as a search listening specialist and you know pioneering the concept of search listening health, looking at the digital information experience from the view of our patient and healthcare professional stakeholders, is that I see all of the time um, that people don't turn to the internet with a URL. They start with a question asked mm -hmm. in their own natural language and infused with the feelings that they have at that point in time as well. And so traditional search has been woeful at responding to this. And we often see a real big digital disconnect between the type of question that's asked and the, the support that that person maybe needs in that moment and the kind of content served back to them in, in those website options. So this tool, as it's been integrated into search engines is actually perfect to reflect back. And I think we're going to find greater engagement and greater reliance and trust on the concept of Dr. Google as we move forward. 
Um, so, so that is one thing about the way that people ask the questions and the way that these, these machine learning models kind of respond back um, that we're going to see that's going to drive a deeper relationship between the two than what's been had to date. Out of all the companies that are in this space right now, which one do you feel like is doing it the best? Um, well, I mean, Google always has that market leadership position. We had, I think, an estimated 92% of internet users around the world are using Google. But Bing has been actually attract, attracting a lot of um, user traffic across because they were very quick to integrate, I, guess, I believe, the chat GPT platform into the new Bing. People were really curious and wanted to try it. So I guess that's an indicator of what's going to be happening as people like they are embracing this way of exchanging information and seeking advice. The other thing is that when you ask a follow on question in traditional search, you kind of have to go back and it starts again. And in this model, you've got conversation that just follows and it knows that you're on the same topic. So you can ask a complicated follow up question and it knows that you're talking about that topic, whereas traditional search would be like, what, what are you asking? Because um, each question, each query is a start from scratch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I've tried the Bing uh, interaction and I just feel like it's, it's a little clunky right now. And when do you think that it's going to start to get to this point where it's a little bit more user friendly and a lot more analogous to having a conversation with an actual human being? I feel like it's going to happen in a heartbeat. Yeah. Yeah. These changes, if you think where we've come from November when ChatGPT first launched, like think how much has changed in that short period of time. You know, I feel like we've blinked. When I wrote the white paper, it was almost impossible to publish it because things kept changing. You've got MedPalm 2 and tools like that coming out that are going to be specific for healthcare. And it's like, oh, well, we were talking about this and now we need to talk about this. Um, so it is a constantly, like, changing landscape. The goalposts are constantly moving. Um, I would not underestimate how quickly these changes are going to come about. And I would urge everybody across the healthcare, well, you know, network to be proactive in responding at the very, very least. Understand the tools, have played with them, and, and consider the impact on the decision-making that your patients um, are having. What is that med palm? Is that what you said? Is that a yeah? I think I, it was I have Google's, heard of it. Yeah, Google's med palm too. I think it's designed just for medical um, queries. Okay, interesting. I'll have to check that out. I, that's great yeah. to talk to somebody like you because you learn all sorts of new things like that. I've just been using Google and PubMed. Um, that's those are like my primary go tos. Um, so let's just take a step back for a second and just talk about artificial intelligence in general, right? Like, I yeah. know that there's a lot of negative connotations with artificial intelligence. How do you feel about it? Because you're kind of in this space and you've, you've seen how it's affected search and obviously raised a few red flags for you. How do you feel about it just in general? Overall, I'm super excited about it. I mean, I think if we harness it in a really productive way, I think it's got huge potential. One of the ideas that came out of our roundtable was what we undertook to inform the genesis of the white paper was the concept of hybrid consultations. And we are seeing some startups start to adopt that and derive that certain medical centers starting to dabble in that. So you would have a, um, rather than the patient going away, and this I'm sure happens for you, Dr. Orson, they go away and they look things up and they don't necessarily disclose to you what they've looked up, but it's sitting there in the back of their mind when they're having a conversation with you and it's influencing the way they respond to your advice. So what we're suggesting with hybrid consultations is that since you've got all of the knowledge that's been published on the entire world wide web at your fingertips, you may as well, sorry about my words, I haven't had enough coffee this morning. Um, you may as well harness that, right? Like bring it in and, and use it when you're having a consultation with a patient to understand, you know, this series of symptoms to consider what maybe blood tests they might need 
what other diagnostic tools, um, what other alternative um, healthcare steps they might be able to take with diet and lifestyle, like draw upon all of that knowledge in the consultation itself. And by doing that, you take this activity that's happening in a blind spot out of the dark and put it in the light and bring it into real time during that consultation with them. And the benefit of that is that they will feel like, okay, I was going to do that anyway. So now it's, it's here and, and we're, we're using this tool. And so they're going to appreciate that. The most important thing is you as their healthcare provider would have an opportunity to discredit misinformation in real time. Mm -hmm. So you yeah. would be able to educate them and be a digital antibody as it were and educate them by saying, well, let's just check this reference is verified and then actually put it into PubMed and check that it does come up. And then you'll see them have that aha moment and hopefully you'll start to mitigate like their secret consultation with these tools that's driving their decision-making around their health and, mm -hmm. and give them like a bit of a sense of, oh, well, I do need to make sure that I verify the advice that I get here before I act on it. So that was yeah. one of the really big ideas. And that's something I'm super excited about. And I would encourage the healthcare community to adopt it. Yeah, I hope that that's something that happens as a culture shift. Right now, I feel um, like the trust of the patient is more so given to the internet than it is to the doctor that they're, they're going to. And I would hope mm -hmm. that enough information gets out there so that they use the internet as kind of a preliminary analysis. And then they come to see me as a trusted healthcare professional to kind of guide them. Right now, I just feel like it's the reverse, right? Like they, they come yeah. to see me and they get information and then they verify that through the internet to make sure that that's something that's accurate. And then I'm guilty of it as well. Like when I go to, you know, uh, specialty appointments for myself or for my wife or my daughter, you know, I get the information, I sit there and I nod my head yes. And then as soon as I walk out the door, I'm verifying everything that, that person said with the internet, you know? And I was and just I did, going to ask you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. Doctors I, I mean, Google too. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's it just it like, I, I feel like when people look towards a physician, they look at them right now as if this is like a singular person on an island. And they may not know everything that there is to know. And the internet knows everything that there is to know. And so they, they use the internet as something that is much more trusted and much more reliable than the actual physician in front of them. And I agree to a certain extent because, you know, we are somewhat on an island as, as individual practitioners because you are only limited by the, your own experience, right? But... I I see value more so in wading through reams of information by a trusted advisor like your physician. And, and I, that's where I think that the, the flip should go. But I don't know. Have, is this something that you've kind of talked about in your, in your industry as well? Have you seen that kind of uh, situation play out? Yeah, I mean, we can tell people not to Google things until we're blue in the face. And we're never going to change the behavior. They've got a digital itch and they're going to scratch it. Um, so I think the more that we just accept that and work with it and integrate that behavior into our approach, then the more successful we're all going to be. And particularly mm -hmm. with the changing way that this information is consolidated and served to them, playing a role together to consult that entity, I think is the best way through this next little period of time, particularly while the system rebalances itself in, mm -hmm. in the favor of evidence. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, like, let's do it. If I was a physician, I'd be throwing a big like screen up in the consultation room um, where you can, you can see it very clearly and, mm -hmm. and, and type it yourself with them, you know, and show them that you're looking at it too and you, you accept that they have this need. Um, and the other thing is, of course, is, is the reality of time. People don't have the time in the consultation that they need to fully wrap their heads around a really big diagnosis. And so 
this pool offers a way to extend that consultation and get more understanding of what's going to happen to them and how to prevent it getting worse and all of those kind of things that they have. The other thing, of course, is it's available at three o'clock in the morning when they can't sleep and they're catastrophizing. Mm -hmm. We think of at least we start during the consultation to bring it in. Because like you say, you're an island, uh, particularly in the general practitioner space where they've got to be on top of treating so many diseases from pregnancy to depression to asthma to chronic ulcerative um, colitis and all of these other things that like how can a general practitioner on the front line know how to triage and direct all of these things and what are the initial prescriptions they need to be writing like it's impossible for them to keep in their head Mm -hmm. um so so you know letting them leverage these tools and doing it in front of patients I think is is a great start because some of the information they're going to get is very valuable to them it might some ideas that they hadn't thought of because they're doing it anyway like the doctor and the patient are all turning away from each other and going online so you may as well come together and do it together yeah can I tell you the part that I'm most optimistic about I am most optimistic about just the administrative work to be done by these oh. AIs. I am just so, I mean, not just for me as personally as a physician, like writing notes and everything like that, but just yeah. checking in, you know, getting your insurance card out, typing it into, you know, the, the like all of these little nitpicky tasks that are so important for us to get right so that the patient gets billed appropriately or you know, yeah. making sure that all of their medications are, I cannot wait till AI takes that over. I think that to me is the biggest uh, breakthrough that's going to happen. That's really going to change not only my life, but the patient experience, you know, when they walk in mm-hmm. and like, oh, you know, we already got all your stuff and you just yeah. sit down and you go to the clinic like, oh, you know, like everything's already been updated. All of this like behind the scenes administrative work. Have yeah. you? Yeah. Have you seen much in regard to to AI working on that stuff? Can you comment on that at all? Um, I haven't been so focused on like its potential for content generation and for saving time, um, because I think you know there, there's so much depth to any one angle of this um, mm-hmm. that if you tried to stay across all of them, it would be really really hard to do. Um, and mm-hmm. my my area of expertise is as a search listening specialist. So it is um, really yeah. focused on, on the exchange of information between search engines and doctors and patients um, mm-hmm. and how to optimize that. So, so I haven't focused on that. But I mean, I think the domino effect, the positive domino effect from what you're talking about is that potentially physicians will have more time for the consultation itself. Mm-hmm. You know, there's not eight pages of paperwork. I think the other thing that's really great to use is the um, the dictaphone uh, feature of, of like a lot of this where you can just transcribe from voice. It's so fantastic. Saves mm-hmm. so much time. And then you just quickly edit it afterwards. Mm-hmm. Um, and in fact, there were big sections of the white paper where I had notes from our workshop and I was like, you know what, rather than trying to type this, I'm just going to read it out and then I'm going to edit it and um you know those kind of things they do save a lot of time and it's pretty exciting yeah i agree i think that you know even voice to text has increased exponentially over the past Mm -hmm. few decades so it's not um utilized as much as it should be but i do think that it just it's not quite there yet because like when you're especially in the medical field when you're talking about very specific terms that are not used very frequently you know, the, the editing process might take a little bit longer than you would expect. Me personally, yeah. I have uh, a scribe or uh, like a, a physician's assistant that's writing all that stuff. Mm-hmm. So, so that that gives them or, you know, that, that gives me a certain sense of intelligence that's that's worked into writing the right stuff. And mm-hmm. I think that's what I hope that is eventually replaced. You know, so I, I agree with you. I, I looked at my own practice and I said, you know, I, a lot of this admin stuff is really taking away from my 
uh, day and I just, I don't want to do it anymore. And so I have incorporated a little bit more, um, what I would say is, is human resources into right. the, into my practice to, lev to, to do a lot of that stuff that I just yeah. don't really feel, I really feel like it just takes away from the whole patient experience. And it's just that necessary evil of healthcare today. It's like, there's just like so much administrative work to, to get done and it leads to physician burnout. And, you know, I just, I don't want to get to that point. But anyway, I, I did want to ask you specifically about searching because I know that's your area of expertise. When people are looking to the internet to get advice, like yeah. what is it that they're looking for? Like, are they typing in, do I have this disease? Or are they typing in drug interactions? Like wh what are like the common things that people are looking for? Yeah, so patients, if we focus on them first, they are searching right throughout the patient journey. Um, and that's why I'm quite passionate about the power of a positive digital information experience to accelerate that patient journey from niggling symptom to diagnosis and getting them on the right treatment. Dr. Awesome, you would know that, you know, best way to intervene and to correct a patient's health condition is to get it early. And we're still seeing people be diagnosed with stage four cancer or diagnosed five or 10 years late with MS and other diseases, we know they've had those symptoms and we know that they've searched for those symptoms um, to understand them. So, so I think, you know, we can turn up better for them. Um, the thing that really was an aha moment for me in the development of my methodology around search the scene health was realizing the way people feel all of those different stages. So if you think about the stages of grief and we go from denial to bargaining, to anger, to acceptance, we see the way that patients are asking questions based on all of those emotions as well. Um, so like in denial, they might be like, you know, could, could my HIV test be wrong? And in bargaining, they might say, can early diagnosis early diagnosed diabetes be reversed um, or newly diagnosed diabetes be reversed um, in, you know, in all of the different stages up until when they start to talk about the disease at the acceptance stage and they call it my cancer, my high blood pressure, um, my scoliosis. Um, so we, we really do see them asking questions at every stage of the journey. In fact, I would go as far to say that Dr. Google, in whatever form he's or she is turning up or being used, is a virtual member of every single multidisciplinary team. And we just need to accept that and take account for that, I believe. Mm -hmm. I want to add that it is aggregated anonymized data that I'm looking at. So I have no idea. I don't want people to feel like they can't use this tool because oh, someone's, you know, looking at my questions. It's it's not like that at all. It's aggregated, anonymized data, and it's really about trying to make sure that content that is served back to them is appropriate and meeting their emotional and factual needs in that moment. Yeah, I, I know it's anonymized and aggregated data, but what are like the top things that people are looking for? Is it mainly to confirm their own diagnosis or are they looking to confirm what the doctor is telling them? Like, what are some general categories of, of what they're actually looking for? I think there's a parallel consultation going on alongside their interaction with their healthcare practitioner. Mm -hmm. um, so literally depending on the category, you'll see them asking questions at, at all of the different points of, like, of the journey. So like you said about when you go and see a specialist or you're, you're talking to a doctor about your daughter, um, you are actually going back and, and checking and verifying that. So it is, it's, it's almost every single point. Um, in some of our market surveys, you know, we were able to confirm that approximately eight out of 10 patients are asking questions about a newly um, like prescribed medication. Mm -hmm. So despite the touch point with the healthcare professional um, who prescribed it, as well as the pharmacist who dispensed it, as well as the packaging itself and any inserts that might be in the packaging, they're still turning to the yeah. internet, 
more generally and, and going, where should I inject this? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm like, oh my God, how come no, that I've noticed. Been answered, yeah. Know? And and honestly, it, it probably has been answered, but it's just not, it, it's not delivered in a way that is as accessible as Google. Like I can That's tell you like, correct. you know, like I'm a surgeon, yes. right? And so like, I, I give post-operative instructions that are very mm-hmm. detailed and, you know, all they have to do is read that. But I get probably three or four calls a day from people that call the office again and ask to, you know, they have no idea what to do with the post-operative instruction. And yeah. many people, when I follow up with them later, are saying, I looked on the internet and like, I think it might be this, you know? And and yeah. I, I, I feel like I don't have like the answer for a way to, for me to do it better than I'm, what I'm already doing it. What I think of it, and correct me if I'm wrong, because you're the expert, but like, I just think it's just the act is easier. It's easier to use Google than it is to, you know, read through yeah. something and, and just something that people are used to. Is that the reason that people are doing this? Or I don't know, I'm, that was just my own thoughts on the subject, but I don't know. Yeah, if it's I think it up. is. Yeah. Um, for the patient, if it was instructions delivered directly to them, you know, they're still groggy from the, um, you know, the general anesthetic. Mm. Um, they're still wrapping their head around what just happened. Um, they're just not in a good space to actually take in that advice that you're getting to them. So they get home and they're like, now I'm ready to focus on it. What was it that I need to do? Mm. Um, and even if you're delivering that information to carers, they've probably not slept for three or four days doing the around the clock shift caring for that patient at their bedside Um, and so they're probably a bit confused too and so the easiest thing in that fog of of sleep deprivation is just to go I've got this one specific question and I've got four pages of instructions here I'm just going to put it into Google Mm -hmm. want that one succinct answer and that's where these new methods of delivering advice are going to be um, really, really powerful because they do get one succinct answer on these new mm-hmm. platforms. Whereas before, yeah. and I, I know that I've, I've been a carer for um, immediate family in hospital and looking up really random questions maybe about the catheter in the middle of the night because I can't get a nurse to come and, you, and you're not finding the answers on page one. But these, these AI tools will find an answer for you and will deliver a response. Um, So I think that's why people are doing it. I think what we're going to probably find is we'll be moving towards tools that accept that this is the behaviour and reflect it with the way that that we work on it. So our team is actually in the process of designing some chatbots where we program exactly the information that is used to inform that chatbot. So mm-hmm. if you've given your patient four pages of instructions, we can take those instructions, plug them in as the source content mm-hmm. to the tool, and then it should, in a perfect world, only give answers from that. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that's cool. I would be interested in that. Let me know when that comes well, we out. Could, we could trial it with you. Yeah, you know, We're I just love dabbling, that. dabbling with it at the moment because I think, you know, the flip side of that from from my point of view, like thinking about medical indemnity and things like that, it's like, what what if it takes this content and spits out an answer that's like, oh, no, that's not what my patient should be doing. Like, Mm -hmm. don't, you know, have a shower and then leave the bandage on for six weeks. Like, how did it get that? Um, But I don't, I think we won't know until we try it. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. as to how good it is. And if it can prevent people going on the broader internet where they may not get locally relevant advice or they may be served some kind of hallucination, then mm-hmm. um, I think it's a good solution, at least in the yeah. interim. So I, I know you have kids, I have kids. Um, have you noticed their interactions with um, search? Is it is it different than yours? Like for, for example, like my kid, she's pretty young, so she exclusively uses like voice uh, activated, like she'll press the button and she'll say, okay, Google play, you know, Miss Rachel, which is like her favorite show or whatever, right? Yeah. And I don't know, like how is, how is how are your kids using search as different from, you know, the way that you're using it? 
I think we're seeing at the two ends of the spectrum a greater adoption of the voice debated mm-hmm. queries. Um, originally, when I was looking at search data before the voice activated search was more common, um, and this was like three years ago, you know, I could see questions that were maybe like a younger patient who's taken the time to type everything out versus Mm -hmm. an older patient or maybe like an older male, say around symptoms of prostate cancer or things like that, where you know that that's a male, Um, you know, it was more truncated and sort of abrupt. Um, But now with voice, we're seeing more full sentences, more natural languages coming through in the search query data. Um, And I think that's happening initially with younger and older people, like my my older friends and family, you know, they they can't see so well on the screen and they can't, it's uncomfortable to type so much. So they just use voice. Um, mm-hmm. But I think it has been more broadly adopted across everybody as we all go, well, that's just a lot easier. Mm-hmm. Um, so the possibility of entering in a specific URL is almost becoming less and less. And it is going to be reliant entirely upon the AI machine to identify yeah. which websites they think are offering the right kind of answers to then be scraped and con- you know concentrated across into those answers. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I, I think that our kids will have a totally different experience with AI than you and I will have. I always think about, you know, my my kid will pro- might have a relationship with an AI robot that is as significant as like a real friendship. You know, we're we're on the mm-hmm. on the cusp of that, and I think that's going to be good. I think that any type of social interaction is good and it, it activates parts of your brain that otherwise might not be available to you. And I, I hope that that's the same thing with search. I hope that it becomes a much more natural and much more human experience than what it is right now, which, you know, I think has served its purpose and done a really good job, but just like, you know, everything with technology can always be better. Right. And so I think yeah. that right now it's not necessarily better but I do think it has the capacity to be better in the future. Like that, the quote that I always say uh, is that the stone age didn't end because we ran out of stone. You know, we have to be providing a better product for us to, to gain the, the next technological level. But listen, Julia, we're, we're getting to the end of our time and there's so many things that I wanted to talk to you about, but I just wasn't able to because yeah. we're just going with the flow of the conversation. So I did want to ask you the three questions that I normally ask all my guests. Um, okay. So number number one, I always ask everybody this, you know, where do you gain inspiration from? Because for me, it is science fiction. I think about the future and I get really hopeful, especially with all of the different re- utopian science fictions that are available to us. Like when I think about, you know, society, I think, man, it would be great if we lived in a Star Trek society without any money and everybody was just able to fulfill whatever wish that they have. When it comes to robots, I look at Isaac Asimov and like, you know, I, I can't wait until robots are watering my plants and walking my dog and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but what what draws inspiration for you when you're doing all of your oh. work? Well, I think I think one of the biggest shifts that is happening across the world and particularly among young people is the recognition of the importance and value of our natural environment. Um, and, you know, people actually stepping up and run, rather than considering development to be leveling and, and building over everything, um, actually protecting biodiversity, wildlife corridors, understanding the critical role that, that forests and, you know, wide open spaces actually play in, in our global climate and in our overall um, global ecosystem. So so I, I get really excited that I feel like finally there's a movement where we've really ignored the importance of that aside from a few people on on the peripheral of society who've been advocating for this for a long time it it gives me hope that environmentalism is now becoming mainstream Mm -hmm. Um, and I want to thank the younger generation and encourage them to continue to do this because health is nothing without a healthy environment without clean water without clean air without you know the avoidance of the kind of catastrophic storms and that that we're seeing as a result of a rapidly warming climate 
we are at a tipping point where there's still a chance with a huge movement to change the course of history. Um, and, and I am getting a lot of hope from that. Yeah, I, I yeah. think that, you know, it, it has to be balanced, right? And, and with all of this technology, I think that there is that shift towards understanding how it fits in with our lives as, as human beings who are animals and from this earth. And, uh, you know, I had a mm -hmm. biological anthropologist on the program a few weeks ago. And he was saying that, you know, our height of health, like our height, like, like we've been yeah. tallest that we ever, we ever were, the largest brain size that we ever were was during uh, the, the Stone Age, you know, when we had, when we were hunter gatherer species and granted, like you had a lot of risks of trauma and all sorts of, you know, other diseases that might've affected you, but just from a health perspective, from the fossil record, that was like the time of most health. So I think that there's going to be some sort of balance between how we lived back then and, and all of the technology that's available to us right now. So I agree with you. Um, yeah. second, second question is, you know, you've lived in a lot of different places. You lived in America, you've lived in Italy, you've lived in Australia. Um, who, who do you feel like delivers the best healthcare? And like, I know that's a loaded question. Oh, you know, I know but, that this is very clear yeah. to me. Yeah. So, okay. If it's clear to you, then just, you know, you feel free to answer, but I feel like it's a loaded question because, you know, each, everybody has their strengths and weaknesses. So how do you mm. feel about the whole situation? Well, I mean, I lived for 10 years in the USA. Um, my children were born there. We had operations there. We had emergency room visits. Um, so, you know, I'm familiar with that health system from a first person, you know, using that point of view. Um, I think what is wonderful about the US health system is the individual people and the work that they're doing on the ground. And, and I think there's an overall vision for it being the best in the world. I think what happens as a handbrake on that potential is the financial machine that is looking to extract value and profit out of the healthcare system. So I think what's happening in a fully privatized health system is you're losing sight of the value of public health. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it, like public health actually is what makes the economy go around. Someone not being sick means that they're back producing. Someone not having to be in the hospital for them, caring for them, means that that person is back in, in, the, in the community producing and adding value. Um, to their friends and family just by being there and not being completely distraught and distracted by a health issue. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've seen the downside, I think, of that in the US as well. So coming back to Australia and, and looking at the Australian health system through that lens, we have state-of-the-art healthcare here. It is, it is next level. Mm -hmm. um, I had to care for my family through, um, I think it was eight ortho major orthopedic operations in six years, kind of lost count. Um, and, you know, not one of them cost a cent, mm. which is like, you know, I did not need to use my health insurance for any mm. of them. Um, and, and that, like, the pressure that takes off families. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you, you're not you're not mortgaging your house. Yeah, yeah. You're not using your entire disposable income for a health issue for one member of your family. Where you now, how do you pay for the car repayments and the mortgage and the food, and mm -hmm. the school? Mm -hmm. um, it is just really, really game changing. And you know, I I really am a very, very strong believer in the value of a strong public health system. And here in Australia, I'll protect it until the day comes home. I am very, very happy to pay tax, additional tax, that is specifically for the Medicare levy, because mm -hmm. it's not one where there's like an insurance company that's needing to cover these costs and deliver profit to shareholders, siphoning off money in that process. Mm -hmm. um, just mm -hmm. for capital growth because the bigger picture is about public health outcomes and the bigger picture is about getting people back on their feet so it's not a model where you're wanting to like 
make money because oh the people are still sick six months from now three years from now and you see that in the health data in the US you spend more on healthcare than any other country in the world and you've got poorer health outcomes so yeah. to me it's, it's really clear even though I know what you're saying like the question can be loaded and the answer can be contentious but I'm I'm of the belief let's call it what it is <laughs> it needs to be fixed <laughs> yeah I think I think you know we're just Personally, you know, having worked in the system, I just think it's, it's, we're just still stuck in the 20th century. And I think that the 21st century, and there is a lot of more focus on this now, especially post-COVID. Mm. Um, like, you know, in yes. the 20th century, I feel like it was a lot of focus was on sick care, which is you get sick and we take care of you. Now, mm. preventive care is more in the limelight and it's more in the focus. Mm. You know, my, my niece is in medical school and she cool. and she uh she's like you know what i feel like the real um exciting stuff is happening in public health so she's doing take, she's taking a year off and getting her master's in public health because she knows that like just like you're saying that's something that is more in the limelight and i feel like even on just like a cultural level we're all more focused on preventative health and longevity and stuff like that so i, th I just think that you know this system needs to catch up at least I hope yeah. that's the way. Um, but I agree with you. I think that we need to prevent people from going to the hospital in the first place. So, uh, so that's cool. It's nice to hear your perspective. Um, the last question, I want to know, you being an expert, what you think that the, I mean, we kind of touched on this a, a little bit already, but what do you feel like the future holds for your field, like in regards to search and healthcare? Like, how do you, if you could, wave a magic wand and create the vision that you want for the future, what would the future look like in 10 years? Um, I, I'm just going to just quickly touch on the, if you use the word expert there, it makes me laugh because my dad always used to say like, X is an unknown quantity and spurt <laughs> is a drip under, under pressure. And I always thought it just made me laugh. Um, but no, but genuinely, I mean, I, I am a, a search listening specialist and I spend all day every day looking at search data and I get very, very excited about the fact that we've shone a light now to illuminate an aspect of the digital landscape that we didn't previously understand, because now we can look at it through the end user's lens and, um, and by knowing the problems that are there, we can actually address them and fix them. And I think the biggest things coming through are the need for empathy. And these AI tools are actually doing that. So I put in my um, presentation at the Hit Lab conference in New York a couple of weeks ago, um, some examples to compare, like I've hurt my knee, what can I do in normal search? And you get your menu of ranked websites and in, um, in New Bing, and it's like, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. And then gives you a really succinct like list of actions that you can take. And then says, I hope you feel better soon. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, we're seeing a shift towards empathetic delivery of health advice online. And I think that that's really exciting because it's going to drive patient engagement. Um, and I think it, it's the accessibility of that. The more that as an industry, we can try and shape it to ensure quality content is delivered, to ensure accountability for poor answers is, is you know, somehow... Um, processed, then we can we can actually make sure that um, people, whether they can afford it, whether they can geographically access it or not, are able to get quality health advice to just, you know, drive their decision making. And like you say, focus on preventative health, intercept their processes and their queries earlier in the patient journey and get them to have the right tests at the right time get them onto the right treatment or preventative measures at the right time to stop it from becoming a really big problem down the track. That's cool. I, I hope that we get to that vision of the future for search. I, I think that that's going to be a really exciting time to live in. Well, thanks everybody for joining in us today at the Futurist Society. For our listeners, uh, you know, Dr. Or, uh, Dr. Austin will be back next week uh, with another podcast. And uh, Julia is going to be uh, available on lots of her different media outlets. So if you want to check her out, she's on, uh, on the internet. I'm sure you could search her very easily. Uh, yeah. Anyway, nice, nice, to, uh, nice to speak with you, Julia. And for the listeners, I'll see you in the future. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you so much, Dr. Olson. 
We appreciate you taking part in today's episode. Take this chance to reimagine a better future by joining a community of futurists who strive for a remarkable world. Be a part of this growing network and contribute to making the world a more positive place. Visit thefuturistsociety.net and subscribe to the show so you don't miss a drop of hopeful futurism.